Welcome and thanks for joining us on World Inside. I'm Natalia and in for Tim Wade tonight. Our headlines today. Tensions escalate in Eastern Europe and the Baltics as NATO members and its partners jointly hold the largest joint military drill in Eastern Europe to date against neighboring Russia's wishes. Plus, a man of musical talents, American Chinese writer and rock musician Kaiser Kuo shares his experience of riding the waves of China's contemporary rock scene over the last 30 years. Our top story, NATO members and partners are holding their largest ever joint exercise since the Cold War in Poland since Tuesday this week. Now it comes at a time when Central and Eastern European nations are seeking strong security guarantees amid concerns about Russia. Moscow has caught the move, quote, unjustified, insisting that the presence of NATO troops close to its borders is a threat to its security. The biggest drill on NATO's eastern flank. Codenamed Anaconda 2016, the exercise will last two weeks. It involves over 30,000 troops from Poland, the US and 17 other NATO member nations, as well as five NATO partner nations. This exercise confirms that we can look towards the future calmly because we have good allies and good partners. The maneuver is held one month before a NATO summit in Warsaw that will approve more troops to be stationed in Eastern Europe. So interoperability and the readiness, the collective readiness of NATO forces is what this is all about at the operational and tactical level. But at the strategic level, uh, it's all about uh, NATO having the capability to make sure that it remains free and independent for all of its member states. To Russia's northwest, NATO troops conducted another operation from June the 6th to June the 9th. The International Naval Exercise, Baltop 16, is the largest annual military exercise in the Baltic Sea. This year's operations mark the first time U.S. Marines have practiced landing exercises so far north. In 2016, NATO and its partners will conduct around 150 different military exercises. Moscow fiercely opposes NATO's moves. The expansion of NATO's military infrastructure to our borders and its engagement in military activities with other countries of the bloc has aroused our discontent. Russia has the sovereign right and power to secure its safety by all reasonable methods, considering the possible risks. In 1997, NATO formally agreed not to install permanent bases in former Warsaw Pact states. But after the Ukraine conflict erupted in 2014, NATO established a high-speed spearhead response force. Moscow sees NATO's drive eastwards as an aggressive violation of the post-Cold War agreements. And Russia is fighting back. According to the Russian defense minister, the country will hold more than 2,000 drills this year to improve its combat response. The Cold War era might be long gone, in official terms but a semblance of the same tension seems to be building up once again in Europe. Now for more on NATO's military drill, we're joining Washington, D.C. by George Benitez. He's the director of NATO Source and senior fellow in the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security at the Atlantic Council. In Moscow, we have Mr. Pavel Falgenhauer, a Russian defense analyst who's joining us on the phone. And also in Kiev, we have Michael Baranowski is the director of the German Marshall Fund Warsaw office. Welcome to you all. So this is said to be the largest war game, largest military maneuver in Europe since the end of Cold War. Lots of dangers exposed, lots of rhetoric going around. Uh, yet U.S. official coming out saying that this is purely defensive. There's nothing to be nervous about. Uh, let me start with Mr. Benitez there. Do you stand by that statement? This is purely defensive? I totally do, and I think the facts speak for themselves. This exercise may seem large, but that's only because NATO has been doing very small exercises since the Cold War. Um, in fact, just in April, the Russians themselves had a SNAP exercise of over 30,000 troops. So this exercise is a small exercise, and it's, it is a purely defensive one. And what do you think, Mr. Baranowski, joining us in Kiev? I agree. Uh, Russians have done much larger exercises, actually practicing, among other things, nuclear attacks on NATO member states, including nuclear strike on Warsaw. We have to remember that there is nothing provocative about trying to defend members of your own alliance while that is 
obviously being aggressive in the region. Uh, that is, uh, that is naming NATO member states as an enemy in its military doctrine. Um, is, is being just openly aggressive to the NATO's eastern flank in, uh, in particular, and they have much larger forces amassed uh, right on our borders um, of Poland, uh, but the Baltic states. Uh, and let's not forget, I'm speaking to you from Kiev uh, in Ukraine. In Ukraine, there is an ongoing war uh, that has been started and is being perpetrated by Russia. There are Russian troops on Ukraine soil fighting a war as we speak. Now, so there me, is nothing provocative all about right, what Let me bring in Mr. Fagenhauer. He's uh, joining us on the line from Moscow. Sir, how do you make this, the nature of this military drill? Do you buy that? Are you convinced that this is purely defensive in nature? Do you think that NATO is playing fire there here? Uh, well, of course, all sides are saying that they're in defensive posture. It was the same during the Cold War. Uh, but defensive, strategic defensive posture sometimes involves tactical offensive action or could involve. So talk about, when they all talk about defense, that doesn't mean much. Uh, problem is that there's a kind of build up of it's not a tension and to some extent forces. Up to now, uh, there's been kind of uh, a vacuum of kind of forces there, in the, especially in the Baltic area and uh, Poland, nothing like during the Cold War when great time parties were standing ready to attack each other. But uh, a vacuum of forces is also kind of dangerous thing, everyone understands it, so it's about how quickly you can fill that vacuum. And when both sides are training to fill vacuums, well, that movement that should be seen as provocative and could lead to unneeded additional tensions. And from the Russian point of view, especially disturbing is that some Ukrainian soldiers are also taking part in this anaconda uh, uh, exercise. And that is seen as, of course, uh, the West uh, continuing the policy of kind of bringing, dragging in Ukraine into Western alliances, probably, possibly into NATO. And that's seen as rather unacceptable. And let's now take a look at the mission of Anaconda 2016. Uh, first Airborne Task Force lands in West Poland and stimulates capturing territory before moving troops and equipment through a safe passage. Uh, then over 1,000 paratroops land to participate securing terrain east of the Vistula River. And next, I think we have the map here, engineers build a bridge over the Vistula and troops and vehicles are expected to cross and travel to Lithuania for another exercise on June 10. So what we find here on this map is that when the drill comes to an end, uh, Russia's Kaliningrad will be surrounded. So, Mr. Benitez, do you think that this is a message that NATO is deliberately sending there, that it is capable of doing the same that Russia has done to Crimea? And, and how will Russia respond? I'm not sure the, your description of the activities is, is that accurate um, because NATO is doing those things, but take a look at what they are. It is, as you said, it is starting off by uh, an activity of dropping off paratroopers in the western part of Poland, hundreds of miles away from the Russian border, so it's not provocative. It's clearly another attempt by NATO to show that this is a defensive exercise. And you look at some of the other exercises you mentioned, such as building bridges and trying to improve the flow of NATO forces to be able to reinforce NATO allies. The problem here and the reason for all these tensions is because of Russia. Russia is like a thief that complains when people try to build alarm systems in their house. And then the thief complains, well, these, are be these alarm systems are being provocative and they're threatening my livelihood. Well, that's because the thief is trying to get into houses that it shouldn't be. These types of exercises are to show that NATO can protect its house, can protect its members, but they're so geographically far from Russia and of sufficient size that they're clearly not a threat to Russia. But how capable is the NATO force now? Uh, Mr. Baranowski, uh, how serious, this is to show European nations, of course, that NATO is serious about the security in this region, but do you think that the new allies, new partners of NATO will be convinced uh, about NATO's forces given what happened to uh, Crimea, that NATO forces failed to overturn the situation there in Crimea? 
There is no doubt that in case of a crisis of a, or a war, NATO will come to the defense of all its members, including the Baltic states, Poland and all the Frank um, uh, countries. What we need to do is we need to exercise. Uh, we also need to be more serious about the deterrence posture in the region, precisely because Russia has such an overwhelming force that is, that is already on our uh, borders. The exercise that we are talking about, Anaconda, is just showing the ability of the Western uh, uh, allies, including the United States, to come with reinforcements in case of something happening. But these are initially reinforcements. These are very small forces comparing to uh, what Russia has. It's in fact about 10 uh, Russian soldiers to a one NATO uh, soldier uh, in, in the region. This is, the, the, we, we are moving from, uh, from a posture of reassurance, um, just providing the sort of moral support for the, for the countries like Baltic, Baltic states and, and Poland to a posture of deterrence. There is saying, sending a clear signal to Russia that there will be in fact a very high price if they were trying to do something similar to what they have done in Crimea or in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Fagenhauer joining us on the line here. So Poland and countries that border Russia, adding to what's just been said there, are very concerned with Russians' aggression in this region, and they fear that this kind of behavior uh, will spread into their own border. That's their concern. Uh, what do you make of these concerns? Well, what, right now, the kind of uh, threat assessment is very hazy especially on the western side of it. They are talking about that maybe Russia will intervene to kind of uh, try to support or maybe actually bring into the fold large Russian-speaking minorities in Estonia and Latvia. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be at all on the Russian agenda. Uh, but, of course, Russia does have uh, uh, legitimate concerns in this region, and the main concern for already maybe 20 years has been the security of the Kaliningrad enclave, uh, which is, of course, surrounded by NATO countries and could be cut off of the uh, uh, attachment to Russia by sea or air through international waters is also very complicated and easily interrupted. So this uh, has been seen by the Russian general staff in Moscow as a very dangerous point for a long time and most Russian exercises, beginning even in the 90s when there was President uh, Boris Yeltsin who was rather friendly with the West, and when Putin, who was also friendly, at least in his first term, uh, we, the still Russian military were preparing exercises and possible action to defend Kaliningrad. Now it's becoming even more of a possible flashpoint, which could actually bring an unneeded, unwanted by anyone escalation if there's some kind of incident happening there in the Baltic region, just as I don't know who, planes colliding, like in, uh, say, 2001, south of Henan Island, uh, American and uh, Chinese plane collide, the same could happen over the Baltic, could be in a serious crisis, troops will begin to move on both sides, in protective maybe manner, but this could lead to an escalation that could get totally out of hand. Now, Mr. Benitez, your response to that? Because adding to what Mr. Fagenhauer just said, another Russian official even go as far as calling this, you know, the NATO is laying the groundwork in Eastern Europe for, quote unquote, a global strike against Russia. How do you respond to that? I think there's no basis. Um, Russia, as I said before, is the one that is escalating these tensions. Russia is the one that has invaded two of its neighbors in the last eight years. Russia is the one that is violating NATO airspace and holding its exercises, these 24-hour snap exercises, in secret. Um, the things NATO is doing are very different from what Russia is doing. NATO is holding smaller exercises. Uh, for example, this exercise, Anaconda, this was planned over a year ahead. Russia was invited to send observers to even see it, uh, but Russia declined to do so. 
so, um, whereas Russia holds its exercises in secret. So if Russia really w is sincerely wants to d uh, decrease tensions in the regions, then it should f do what NATO is doing rather than complain against it. It should decrease the size of its exercises, and it should be more transparent and notify people about what it is doing. Mr. Fagenhauer, why did Russia decline to send any observer to Operation Anaconda 2016, and what do you make of the accusations that Mr. Benitez just made against Russia? Well, uh, trading accusations is not really a productive way of doing business. I mean, that kind should be maybe relegated to the uh, git prop guys to propaganda because, well, there is a problem, and the first thing is to recognize there is a problem. There is growing tensions, there's three militaries on both sides uh, talking about trading who's more to blame does not really help at all. Uh, diffusing the situation could have been much better. Uh, transparency is also some of a problem because, again, there's trading and accusations. Who's more transparent? Who's allowing what? Russia says that the West is not transparent. The West says that Russia is not transparent. The uh, black communications uh, exchanging accusations, and that's the course for worse confrontations in the future. Okay. Then let me finally turn to Mr. Benitez. Um, your final remark on NATO's ultimate goal of mounting this military tension with, with Russia, uh, how will NATO benefit from this movement, and also will NATO increase its military activities, uh, affect U.S. devotion on its plans in Asia Pacific? I think there's a difference between allegations and facts. The fact is that for many years now, NATO and its members have been decreasing their defense spending, cutting their defense capabilities. But for the last eight years, Russia has been increasing its defense spending um, and has been using force to take territory from its neighbors. And it's because of that that R NATO is now starting in the last couple of years to increase its de defense spending and try to match what the Russians are doing to provide a defense from the Russians. Um, and these exercises such as Anaconda and Baltops, these are to show that NATO is willing to defend peace um, and to stand for the defense of its members. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Benitez joining us from Washington, D.C., and Mr. Fagenhauer joining us from Moscow on the line there. Now, stay with us here on World Insight. We've got our final segment coming up. An ever-changing beats American-Chinese rock musician Kaiser Kuo shares snippets of his 30-year journey of China's evolving rock music scene. That's next. Stay with us. Capitalizing on the new global economic reality, Thousands of government and business leaders convene in Russia at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. CCTV News on the Sea brings you in-depth analysis and coverage exploring the new geo-economic dynamics that govern our world. Welcome back. What constitutes contemporary society for any place and any time is always fascinating to define. It's a daunting task in a country like China, which has gone through dramatic changes over the past three decades. Or perhaps an anchor point such as rock and heavy metal music could help. Now, rock has existed in China for at least 30 years. It has gone from being a youth culture and achieving great commercial success to going underground before hitting the popular mainstream again. Now, the ups and downs of rock are strongly tied in to the evolution of contemporary China. Its musicians, particularly those that stand out, have become icons. Today, let's meet one of them, Kaiser Kuo, an American Chinese guitarist and a writer who has spent almost 30 years in China. But first, let's take a look at this before we bring you World Inside host Tian Wei's exclusive interview with Kuo right before he leaves China. <laughs> Starting from scratch, about 30 years ago, rock music came to China for the first time. It was in those early years that many bands such as Tang Dynasty and the Panthers were established. However, the growth of Chinese rock and heavy metal hit some bumps in the mainland. Far from being in line with mainstream culture, it slid into the underground music scene. 
but it still remains a remarkable part of Chinese city culture. Among them, Tang Dynasty stood out. It was in 1989 that Kaiser Kuo came to China from the U.S. and co-founded the band. Later on, in 2001, he built a new band known as Spring and Autumn. Together with his friends in rock and metal music, Kuo has spent decades changing the Chinese city music scene, starting with Tang Dynasty.、Uh, a band called Tang Dynasty would immediately resonate with people who understood that the Tang. Was the, a great dynasty in Chinese history precisely because it was open to external influences, because it was so cosmopolitan, because there was this sort of almost fetish for things that were Tang. So that name just came up very easily for it, you. It didn't. It, it was actually the, the 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 result of some long thinking that I did on my part. And the other members agree with you. They did. They did. They liked it. it, and it resonated with them really well. I kept it in my back pocket. I waited until we were having the conversation where we were going to come up with the name of the band. And as soon as I said it, they all agreed. This was the name of the band. The style of the band or of your music is very much traditional Chinese music or folk music, but in a grand way, combined with so-called Western style heavy metal. Yeah, I actually think that it, it in many ways, is maybe a, a good cipher for my whole identity. Right?、Um, I, I've always wanted to find something.、Uh, To promote, to latch onto, and 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 to elevate in traditional, in what what is you know traditionally Chinese. I always, I didn't think it would be of much interest for me to do to, to pour a lot of time and effort into a band that was just going to be doing generically Western style music. I always wanted it to do something that that had、uh, that was recognizably Chinese. <laughs> Popular, right? And it was o- almost like overnight popularity. Yeah. So、um, let me let's make it very clear that I left in '89. That's right. I wasn't here when they got signed. I wasn't here when they they reformed. I wasn't here when they they really got famous. By the time I came back in '91, they were already well on the、mm. way. So I can take like no no real credit for 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 what. But what, still, you feel the two extremes. It shaped me.、Um, I think one of the things that 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 early moment of sort of stardom、uh, did was it, it made. Us, I'm not really cut out for that.、Hmm. <laughs> and I, I never. After that, I never really. How、thought. did you realize that? I mean, I, I think. What was that, the moment? What was the thing? There wasn't a, a single moment. I think that part of it was just that, that I never really felt like this was what I wanted to do with my whole life. I never felt like this was going to to be. Enough for me. I mean, it didn't、What? have. Well, I mean, I don't want to sound.、Uh, I, I think honestly, I, I felt、ahead. like I, it was. Sure, I was going to be impactful, but I'm a. I was a foreigner.、Uh, I didn't want to be a missionary. I didn't want to feel feel like that. But but also, I wasn't cut out for th- that life. I mean, I I may appear to be you know a, a, a kind of all night partying rock and roller. I'm actually. I live a, a very、uh, kind of normal、uh, upper middle class person's <laughs> life. I, I read a lot. I. I, I、uh, You're a writer. I write. I spend an, an unhealthy amount of time on social media. I mean, I. I do a lot of of of.、Um, I, and I, I. I'm. I'm interested in in things other than music for sure. I mean, music is 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 actually not so high up on my list of. Of, of 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 things that I want to leave to this world. So. So you don't think that is the life you want? No, and then also you know just that that lifestyle. It it I, I'm not just constitutionally cut out for it. I I you know I like seven or eight hours of sleep a night. I don't really thrive well on that. I can't just eat ramen and and、um, and then you know I'm I'm it's it's a pretty wild life. And I'm I'm a pretty well conservative person in a lot of ways. Back in the 1990s, what was it like? It was wonderful. I, mean, it was,、um, I think、um, I, I still think back with great fondness on those times.、Uh, there were maybe a hundred people involved in what was called the Yowen Chuar, the, the, the rock circle, and this this includes the musicians themselves, the hangers-on, the the、uh, producers, as far as there were any, the people who owned venues. 
uh, all told, there were maybe 100 individuals <laughs> in it. So it was a really tight circle that it embra embraced a lot of different kinds of music back then. People didn't differentiate c clearly among genres. I mean, we all hung out together, uh, irrespective of what kind of music we were playing. Uh, it's gotten a whole lot more fragmented now, but it's also gotten a whole lot more diverse. There were, uh, there's every genre of music under the sun now. But back then, I think part, there were a lot of problems. Though. I mean, part of it was that uh, there was so much interest in it. Um, uh, part of it was because uh, the outside media was so interested in this phenomenon uh, that the, the few who were playing in that scene, uh, irrespective of how good they actually were, in, irrespective of how, how much depth they actually had, how much talent they could actually draw on personally, they all got famous. Some of them didn't maybe deserve it. I certainly didn't. I, I felt like I landed on a low gravity planet uh, I'm a, a stubbornly and decidedly mediocre guitar player. I'm not very good. And I was good enough then, but I certainly, if I were you know, in any other mature music market with my really middling talents, I wouldn't have amounted to anything. So I got very lucky. But it's it's not just about the, the techniques, it's also about having the courage to form a band. Well, hell, I mean, what did I have this? I didn't have anything at stake here. Was I, was I going to starve if I didn't succeed? No. This was, a, again, part of the problem with me is that I had a, a really kind of dilettantish attitude toward it. And I, I regret to this day uh, having imprinted on, on, on rock uh, some of the ideas that I did, which were, which were kind of dilettantish. Which what were, do you mean? I mean, I, I wasn't uh, somebody who had to ever care about the market success of the band. So I was, I felt totally, uh, a total lack of, 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 of need to, to do music that would appeal to a broad mass. I, I, so we ended up, if you look at Tang Dynasty's second album, for example, you know, probably the average length of song on that album is like eight or nine minutes. It's, they're all ridiculously long. <laughs> some even 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some really ridiculously long songs. On when uh, Zhang Ju, uh, the bass player of the band uh, passed away In because May of traffic accidents yeah. and of course uh, everybody were gathering together in order to celebrate his life and many other things but many wonder whether we have over idealized that period of time I just wonder what do you feel about that yeah I, I think that we we have to a very large extent over idealized that time that take nothing away from Zhang Ju, I mean, who is a very dear friend, a wonderful guy. He's a warm, very warm guy. Wonderful guy, in every way. Uh, the, the problem was, I think, well, first of all, there was no competition back then. There was, there was so little competition that a lot of these bands just couldn't really test their metal against, uh, uh, against one another. Um, it's much more real today. And part of the problem was that back then, because of, of just all that media attention, because all that adulation, because of, of, of that early crop of bands, uh, not all of them could really live up to the expectations. Mm. But they stood there in the way for a lot of other bands that might have been able to, to come out and outshine them. Uh, and forever, on everyone's lips, you know, when they thought of Chinese rock, it was that, you know, I mean, it was always going to be these, these, these early bands. Early icons. Early icons. And there were so many other bands that came after, you know, uh, that, that were equally deserving of attention that never got it, in part because they all were always in the shadow. Do you think most of the people in the rock circle realize it just as you did? I think a lot of them do. I think a lot of them now. realize it. I think. Now, at, at the same time, that was a wonderful time. I mean, there, there was this, that, that sense of camaraderie, th this, this real kind of sense of, of, I mean, I think a, a lot of people probably imagine that uh, there was a lot of, uh, of, 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 of challenges, maybe from political authority. Uh, that wasn't really the case. There was an awful lot of space for these people to do what we were, for us to do what we were doing. You didn't have, uh, you know, closures and, and cancellations of shows and strict censorship of the lyrics or, or things like that. There was almost limitless ability back then. What was limited was market uh, and the hardware. I mean, there, you know, it was hard to get good gear or good venues to play at. And we, we played a lot of slipshod places, but th there, was, there was a boundless opportunity. What about the band now? I mean, 
the band Spring and Autumn. Mm -hmm. Once again, a very poetic name, I would say, in Chinese, of course, in English as well. You disbanded it right before you decided to move to the United States. Yeah. It's, it's a band for more than 15 years. 15 years, yeah. Wow. 15 years. I remember two things about you when it comes to music and this band. One is that on many occasions when we were talking to one another over the years, you were telling me and other friends, you have to go because you have to do rehearsals right. with this band. It's something that you will never give up. No, no, no. Under whatever circumstances, when the date of the rehearsal has arrived, that's the thing I'm going to do. Right, right. Very strict with it. Yeah. But that's, that's you know... Is it peer pressure or is no, it... No, 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 no. It's not peer pressure. It's, I mean, it's so fun. I mean, getting together and playing together, I, I don't, I mean, it was, it's even more fun with an audience, of course, but even just being in that one of those underground rehearsal spaces in Beijing, <laughs> when all, when that gigantic sound comes together, it's just, there's something immensely, immensely satisfying. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I remembered when you were with this band, you were telling me that you are very strict about the role that you are playing in the band. Right. A guitarist. Right. Nothing else. You are not going to do the commercials with them. You are not going to be like a, almost a part-time agent for the band for international market. You are not going to do the website for this band. Right. You are not going to. Uh, go on different kinds of promotional trips with them. You, can, you said, well, use my name, that's fine, but nothing else I would do from my part. Are you being selfish? No, I was being realistic. Uh, for the entire time that I've been with that band, I've had full-time jobs. Or even when I, when I didn't, for one short period of time when I was freelancing as a journalist, um, it, that took all my time. Uh, I, I just knew that I had to limit it. The other thing is I didn't, I wanted to manage everyone's expectations. This was not ever intended to be big famous band. This was always going to be, we'll play small club shows, we'll play festivals, we'll do stuff like that. We'll but do our it for the stuff. joy. We'll do it for the joy. And we always did, but we never let our, our ambitions get too outsized. Has the joy period gone? No, the joy remained until the very end. And the last show we played uh, on May 31st here at Yugong Yingshan, right there on that stage, yes. was probably one of the highlights of my life. It was, was so packed, I remember. Yeah, it was just insane. Um, I've never seen a, a bigger density of a crowd. The roof almost off. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, was, it was one of the most just deeply kind of spiritually satisfying moments of, of my life. What was it like for you to stand on the stage? going from piece number one, number two, Well, you know, part of it three, was... Counting almost. Yeah, I mean, part of it, uh, every time we would take off another song and, and play it, I would think to myself, I guess that's the last time I'm going to play that song in front of a crowd. In front of at least such a crowd. Right, and it was, it was sort of sad, I mean, each, each time. Uh, but also, I was just trying not to, 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 to screw up. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, That's important. That's important. <laughs> there's this thing that happens when you're playing um, where sometimes you find yourself in this zone where you would have to labor hard to actually make a mistake. You become, there's this emergent property when you're playing an ensemble where uh, the music overtakes you and you, 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 you have this muscle memory and you couldn't screw up. I mean, you'd have to actually force yourself deliberately to hit a wrong note. Unfortunately, that night wasn't one of those nights where I, I was actually a little too living it. I was too conscious of it. My, my head was turned on. And so I was really conscious of all the, the possibilities. First of all, we were so drenched in sweat. It was like playing underwater, practically. I mean, I was like, you know, so there was, there, there were, there was a lot of possibility that I would over, I, I would, you know, slide past the note that I was looking for or things like that. So, I had to, 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 to be thinking, and at the same time, I wanted to play my heart out, you know, I wanted to really bang my head with ferocity and make sure that, you know, I, I was just getting the most out of uh, my, my last show. Uh, what was the last two songs? 
The last two songs uh, were Tensha. The, the English name we gave it is The Sub Celestial. And uh, it's in, in very many ways, it encapsulates what we wanted to do with Chunqiu. Uh It has that kind of dualism. Of, it has some really, really pretty, almost classical sounding parts in it. And then some ferocious, really headbanging metal in it. Uh, you know, the Chun and the Chiu. Uh, the, the kind of yin-yang dualism that, that we wanted. A and it has a lot of very, very, very deeply Chinese stuff in it. The, the main riffs, the main motifs in it are, are all uh, in a kind of strict Chinese tonic scale, but with uh, interesting takes. It's supposed to evoke kind of horse-born warfare. I mean, it has a lot of sort of dun -dun 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 -dun, just galloping sounds yes. in it. Did you hear the shouts coming from the crowd? Of course, yeah. I mean, it was what's lovely about playing the crowd that, 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 that likes your music so much is they sing along with every single song. They just know every song by heart. They know all the hits, they know all the rhythms, they know when, when to do what. It's almost like they're in part of the performance. How would you say, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, you look back at that day, the last performance of Chun Chiu, and almost the the last performance of a continuous professional music life for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, you know, uh, t missed up a little bit. I'll probably, you know, <laughs> wipe away a little tear. Um, but I'll have a, a, a rueful smile. I mean, I, I'll certainly miss it. There's just no question. Already I do. I mean, it, it, the, the afterglow of that. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, it's like when you're deeply in love with somebody, but they're, you know, in high school, but they're going away to college, and, or so are you, and you know that you have to break up. It's the sensible thing to do, but you love each other. But you made the decision yourself. But you make the decision yourself, right, right. And that was World Inside host Tian Wei interviewing Chinese-American guitarist and freelance writer, rock star, Kaiser Kuo. You're watching World Inside. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're back with World Insight. Yesterday marked China's Dragon Boat Festival, or Duanwu Festival. It is one of the most important traditional festivals in the country. Zongzi, or sticky rice dumplings, is a traditional food that Chinese people enjoy during the Dragon Boat Festival. This year, giant pandas at the Wild Animal Zoo in Kunming City, the capital of southwest China's Yunnan province, will also have a taste of Zongzi. Let's now take a look. Fuxing and Nannan will celebrate their Dragon Boat Festival in a special way. Zookeepers prepared zongzi for the two pandas with unique recipes. This is their first ever Dragon Boat Festival. We made special zongzi for them to celebrate it. This zongzi is different from what we eat, as the filling is made from their favorite cornbread and fruits. He Xing and Nan Nan weren't too impressed with the surprise in the beginning. After finishing their normal meal of apples and bamboo, the two giant pandas cautiously tasted the dessert, which they haven't seen before. But after the first bite, He Xing and Nan Nan find it was simply difficult to stop indulging themselves. Surprisingly, the two creatures knew how to drop the wrappers of the zongzi and only eat the delicious fillings. And that's a wrap for today's program. If you'd like to see more, you can visit our website, type World Insight CCTV News into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel as well. From me, Li Tiu and everyone here at the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around the world. <laughs>